Welcome back to another episode of Palisade Radio. I'm your host, Karema Mutlu. And on today's show, we have David Miller, who's the director of ALX Uranium Corp. Welcome to the show, David. Hey, good morning. Let's talk about your background and let's go over some of the highlights of your career to date, David. I understand you've been in the uranium sector for over 30 years. So how did you end up in the uranium space? Talk to us about that. Well, well, back in the uh, late 70s, uh, uranium was in one of its boom cycles. And a company called Utah International hired me uh, up in uh, Riverton, Wyoming. And at that time, Utah International and a company called General Electric I just merged in the largest corporate merger in history uh, based on uranium assets in Wyoming. And so uh, the Riverton, Wyoming office uh, was the uh, exploration headquarters for that company that had operations from uh, South Africa to Australia and uh, five offices in the U.S. looking for uranium deposits to, uh, to meet the requirements of supplying uranium and with the merger with GE, mostly to uh, GE for uranium supply for their reactors that they were selling like hotcakes at the time. So that that brought me into the uranium sector, and I continued with that company. Uh, again, they had merged with uh, General Electric in uh, the late 70s. In 1982, GE sold the uranium part of the company to uh, the French uh, government company. It was called... Uh, Kojima at the time, it's since changed its name to uh, Ariba, and then just recently they changed their name to Aranco. So uh, that's the that's the history of my background. Is I stayed with that company for 20 years, and then Strathmore came along in the late 90s and hired me to put on put uranium assets together, and then in the early 2000s uh, that took off. And uh, I ended up as the uh, CEO of Strathmore. Uh, We also spun out a company called Fission Energy. And the discoveries in Fission were on properties that I had originally acquired within Strathmore. So I've I've been through a couple of boom and bust cycles. One, The first one, I was hired, and I learned from the people that founded the industry back in the 50s. The the second boom, I was kind of in my prime. And Strathmore became uh, the largest property holder in the Athabasca Basin. I think we had over 4 million acres at one time. And we rolled up, you know, over two dozen U.S. uranium properties. Uh, We actually were so property rich. It was a confusing story for most investors, even though investors that got in early did really, really well. Well, let's move on and talk about Strathmore in a bit more detail. I want to find out what it was like to have a great timing with a uranium company at the beginning of a uranium bull market. Can you share your experience of your time back then and what it was like for an investor and company builder back at the height of 2006, 2007 period? Well, well, in in 2004, I think our our stock price was, was in the 10 to 20 cent range. Uh, the uranium price in 2004 was about 11 or 12 dollars, and I remember getting interviewed back then. And and the gentleman interviewing me, I, he said, "Well, what do you think the price is going to go to?" And and I said, "Well, geez, it, it could go all the way up to 20 dollars." And you have to remember, I I've been through uh, the cycle when it was in the high 40s back in the 70s, and it went all the way down to seven dollars a pound in about 2001, 2002. And uh, so it was quite exciting to get back up to 20. And I knew what production costs were uh, on our Canadian deposits and also on the U.S. in in situ projects. So you know, $20 a pound would would have been a money maker. You know, better than the prices we had seen. But when it got to 20, I, I do another interview, and and the, the 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 movement of the market was so grand at the time that uh, I said, well, geez, it, it might go to $40 a pound. And, you know, we did that cycle three or four times with me doubling the price each time. Ultimately, I said, well, it looks like we're going to go over $100 a pound. And as you may may know, that it went up to almost $140 a pound in the summer of 2007. But, again, a, a drastic thing happened in the summer of 2007. And this is uh, where I always caution people in the marketplace 
is government always gets involved. And in the summer of 2007, the utilities were distressed with the uranium prices becoming so high that they petitioned the U.S. government to release uh, some uranium out of the government stockpiles. They did. So that was the peak of the market when the government started releasing uh, uranium into the uh, the utility marketplace again, and prices started to come down, uh, you know, rather drastically. They, they dropped in about half in several years, and then were starting to recover when uh, Fukushima hit in 2011. And then in 2011, they went all the way down below $20 a pound again uh, a year or two ago, and now we're on that up cycle again where we've recovered back up to uh, to the high 20s. Well, let's move on to today's market. And which catalysts look the most important for you for a new bull market in uranium? Is it having more Japanese reactors come back online? Or is it more increased demand from China who are building out more nuclear reactors year by year? What are the most important catalysts for you going forward? Well, well bo- both of those are, are, are extremely important. You know, the, the Fukushima killed the marketplace. And, and the Japanese utilities, some of the suppliers became net sellers into the market. And that helped, of course, de- decrease the price of uranium below $20 a pound, all the way down. Uh, and, of course, China, and if you've been to China and seen the pollution issues in China, you know, you know everyone talks about CO2 emissions in the U.S., but CO2 emissions in China are far worse. They burn five times more coal than the U.S. does. I think it's something on the order of 5 billion tons of coal per year. In the U.S., they burn less than a, than a billion tons of coal per year. So China has tremendous pollution problems. India uh, also is burning more and more coal all the time to bring up uh, the electricity supply in India to help that economy that's also growing very strongly. And they're also very bullish on nu- nuclear the Japanese, of course, are, are leading the way with, with slowly returning uh, their reactors online. Uh, China talks about renewables a lot, but I think the big uh, big push in reality will be on nuclear power, uh, especially going forward for the next you know 20 to 50 years. Uh, and India will be following suit also. But I'm also seeing you know in the green movement. Uh, a reality setting in with a number of previously anti-nuclear types that are finally realizing that the net cost of nuclear production versus any other energy form in the form of, of, of casualties or fatalities or human lives is so much lower for nuclear power than any other energy source that those, that, that, that's finally dawning on a number of people. So I, I, I can't say how fast that that realization is going to spread in the marketplace, but you know sometimes things happen really fast. Uh, right now, it's it's slowly recovering. The increase uh, Japanese reactors coming online. There's a couple of reactors being built in the U.S. right now. Uh, you know, Europe has to wake up. Uh, I keep reading positive articles about Australia uh, finally considering some nuclear power plants. So. Again, reality is finally setting in and that wind turbines and solar panels aren't going to be the catch-all and the end game for energy in the world. You've had a number of successes within the junior resource space, David. So I just want to talk about the contrarian nature of investing within this resource space. And can you tell us some of the biggest lessons you've learned within this sector or mistakes you've made within the markets? Well, uh, you know, the big, big mistakes, uh, is, it's not, it's having a too complex of a story. With Strathmore, again, we essentially had more uranium properties and more land acquired than all the other uranium companies combined. Okay. So it was a confusing story to the investor. Uh, we started, uh, splitting the company. We, we, at one point, we were we provided the base properties to four other companies, and some of those companies are still going. Uh, and and knowing too much, in my case, uh, about 
uranium mills and, and the cost of production. Now, we had an opportunity to pick up the Blanding, Utah mill that Energy Fuels has. Uh, some of the brokers came to us first and wanted us to consider buying that mill uh, from Denison at the time. And, uh, you know, my history, knowing that mill as the highest-cost uranium mill in the U.S., uh, you know, it was just a no that we didn't want that mill because the, the production costs were way too high. We wanted to build a new mill and and take advantage of, of, of modern technology to uh, to have the lowest absolute production costs once we got our permits on some of our Wyoming projects. So that was another mistake is, is not looking at the bigger picture and, frankly, understanding the uranium sector a little bit too much when – that's really not the driving force sometimes. It's it's more uh, consolidation and, and rolling up other companies uh, is more important. And that's what happened to Strathmore is uh, Energy Fuels, who had nothing before the, the Blanding Mill. They acquired the Blanding Mill with stock from Denison and then commenced to roll up three or four other companies, including Strathmore, Uranert, and, and a couple others. So that, that that was a mistake on my part at the time. Uh, you know, the the, uh, the this was all after Fukushima, so the market was really weak at that time. So not recognizing that and not looking at getting cash flow, at least a, a small amount, was very important uh, when the sector was really depressed. Now we're different. Uh, the market's moving up. Uh, the... Uh, Production around the world is still in deficit as compared to product, uh, consumption, and uh, at some point, things have to give. And as you probably have heard, the, the worldwide cost of production of uranium, my guess is I would put it around $60 per pound, uh, especially when you look at the new costs, that, that incremental cost at the end to supply the last nuclear power plant coming online that's probably 80 or $90 a pound. But the, the low-cost production from uh, Cigar Lake and MacArthur River, uh, you know, offset that where the average would be somewhere in the $60 per pound range. So right now the price is less than half of that. Half of that. So, of course, there's, there's lots of room for the, the price to go up. And there's a number of projects in Canada, in the U.S., that can operate uh, – it's below sixty dollars a pound, so it's it's gonna it's gonna pop at some point. Excellent. Okay, as we begin to wrap up the show, David, is there anything else you would like to share with our listeners today? Well, you know the the, the company I'm a director of now, ALX Uranium. We just did a deal with uh, again the uh, French government company Aranco on a project in Canada called Wheeler River, and it. It lies in between MacArthur River and Cigar Lake. So, you know, I, I love the concept of head frame geology. You know, you look at, you know, in the old gold camps of 100 plus years ago, there's nothing better for a prospector to go in and just look down the mountainside and see a, a bunch of head frames sticking up where people are mining gold and just get on that trend and, and find more gold. Well, it's the same concept in, in, in uranium. Uh, in, in the Athabasca Basin is the trend between Cigar Lake and MacArthur River is a very good trend to be on. And the uh, the company, Aranco, has been operating that property for over 20 years, and they do have some incredible intercepts uh, that they've hit, uh, in my opinion, that could very well be another MacArthur River or Cigar Lake. They just need to be offset. You know, they've hit better than 10% uranium in some of the drill holes from the past. I think doing some very close offsets, 10 or 20 meters off of those. And, uh, you know, I, I uh, follow the uh, the advice of some of my old mine engineering friends that, that had a lifetime of experiences. When you get a hit like that, stay on it. You know, check it out and, 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 and use it to, to lead you to the rest of the main ore bodies. And the uh, Wheeler River has that, and we're very excited to be able to do a deal with uh, with basically the uh, the French government on that project in the Athabasca Basin. So that's that's a real 
policy for ALX and uh, puts us, uh, you know, way up there. All, all of a sudden, being able to acquire a property like that. We, we recently had a dinner at the PDAC in uh, in uh, Toronto and uh, met three of the Aranco guys there. And of course, my background with 20 years in Ariba, uh, we knew lots of the same people. Most of the people I know uh, are retired now. Uh, out of the company, but but these gentlemen knew most of them, and it, it was fun to rekindle that friendship with uh, that company, who have uh, great scientists involved, and and bring in the ALX team, who has a discovery background. Uh, myself and 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 Warren, our CEO, uh, was part of the PLS team that discovered the Patterson Lake South project that uh, uh, Fission has right now. So we're excited. Uh, we think that bodes well for ALX and puts us in the top tier uh, of the juniors uh, exploring in the Athabasca Basin. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for your time today, David, and I'm sure we'll have you back on the show later in the year. Okay, very good. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?